We have three of them. Um, just make sure you look at what they are and whether you need to to complete those. So I'm gonna we're gonna start here and if you will do that, that'd be awesome. Um, okay, we need to make this short. That could be really interesting. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go to Matthew one. Um, and uh, around verse 21. And I'm going to try to do it all from my phone today. Everybody there? We're going to read it here in just a second. Matthew 1, verse 21, the first book of the New Testament. Um, can you hear me okay? I was, uh, I was, I, I read this, this commentary, or not commentary, this devotional uh, just about every day. Um, but I usually can't just read one. I usually end up reading three or four because they're really good. It's by Heidi and Roland Baker. I'm about through it on the third time or so. Um, there, if you if you'd like one, they're over in the house of prayer, and I think they're fifteen bucks or something like that. But I was reading on page three ten. I want to. I just want to read this to you and kind of tell you where I've been and a little bit of where we're going. <clears throat> Roland and Heidi Baker do this incredible work over in Mozambique. Um, they have over 10,000 churches have been raised up in 10 years, which is physically impossible, but they've done that. They're uh, just amazing guys. Roland, <coughs> Heidi is um, this little blonde that's full of energy and the Holy Spirit and is kind of scary to be around. Uh, she is fearless. She, she has been stabbed and put in prison. I don't know if she's been shot, but, uh, but when I was over there, I, she laughed a lot of the time, but I've seen her take machine guns away from soldiers who were pointing at her and, and just, just amazingly raised a guy from the dead while we were there. Just crazy stuff. But her husband is more of an intellectual. He was going to be an engineer, and uh, he, he happened to write this one, and he said this, I have found out that no amount of ministry success, miracles, healings, offerings, and even prayers of salvation can take the place of affection for, for Jesus. All these things are fantastic. Without them, we are nothing more than a, a dead branch. We love fruit like this, but it has to come from a place of loving affection. Sometimes I watch evangelists preach. They talk about the amazing schedules they have, the effects of their healings, the, the money they are offered or the favor on their ministry. They talk about the Bible or speak about encounters they have with people. But, it's, but is it possible to do all that without even mentioning Jesus? And some of them manage it. I don't think you can have one without the other. I want to see all those things happening too, but they have to flow from a heart that is totally in love with Jesus. I don't want to be so excited about all the things that Jesus can do I want to be excited about Jesus himself. Consider the story in Luke 2, 43 and 44, where Mary and Joseph take Jesus to Jerusalem for Passover. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Sometimes we can leave Jesus out of our traveling we can walk ahead and think he is our company is in our company, but he is not. We can leave him out of our services, our preaching, and even our worship. And that's a frightening thought, but it's true. We all need to have a daily encounter with him. We need to examine our hearts and rest our th rest our thinking. More than this, we need to spend time in the presence of Jesus. And everybody said amen, right? Well, here's the deal. You can you can get really busy doing good stuff. 
you can get really busy just doing life. Amen? With all your plans and all the things you want to do and all the movies you want to watch and all the games you want to see on TV and on and on and on. And in the process, do just what he said. And I don't know about you, but I've been there sometimes. And as I was reading it that day, I was challenged, and it bothered me. And I, I said, you know, Lord, I just, I'm just going to stay in the house of prayer this week because I want you to grab my heart. I see some of you yawning, and that, that bothers me a little bit, but we'll get you some coffee. And so I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I, you know, if, if, if my heart is not passionate for the Lord, I'm smart enough to know that I need to look at him and reconnect with him. So I started through the Gospels. I thought, Lord, I'm just going to read it, and I want to see you for who you are. Because sometimes we read the Bible, and we've read it so many times, we put filters on, and we have explanations, and it's, it's like, yeah, I've been there, done that. So I got to this verse, verse 21, and she will bring forth a son. This is in Matthew, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That word save is a word that we throw around a lot here called sozo. And I want you to get a grasp because Jesus died on the cross. We all know that. He died for our sins to be forgiven. Amen? But he didn't just die for them to be forgiven. And, you know, he could have just said, okay, you say yes, I'll forgive you, but then you're on your own the rest of the way. Right? I mean, he could have done that, and that would have been amazing. But he not only died for your sins, he died for you to be free from your sins and free from the one who tempts you and to be healed up, because sozo means healing or whole, healed up from every hurt the enemy has ever perpetrated in your life. That's, that's what Jesus died for. Amen? And that is enough. You know, I was reading that, and I just got whacked. Jesus died for my sins. You know, how much, how much of the time do you mention his name? Because he said there, I, I don't know how many sermons I've heard and not heard the word Jesus in that. He is your Savior. He is. It, it, nothing happens without him. And one of the reasons that we become passionless about him is because we spend no time with him and time about everything else. Right? It, it, it's the truth. And if there's any thing that we should be passionate about is Jesus. We're passionate about lots of stuff. And the, and the reality is it's because we, we are preoccupied with other things. Amen? Now, I want to ask you, I'm, a, I'm looking around. I assume everybody in the room, just about, maybe, is a, is a Christian, right? You're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're saved. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you? Are you sure? Because Jesus, the way he looks at discipleship and the way we do sometimes is not even close. It's not even the same hemisphere. Amen? So I want you to go to Matthew 4, and I'm going to get a little crazy today. It's about time. Amen? I've been pretty mellow for a long time. So if I get a little crazy, it's a good thing. Now, I want you to know, Matthew, though it's the first gospel in the New Testament, Mark was actually the first one written in the New Testament. And Matthew did the same thing. Mark was literally, it was more written to the unbeliever. Matthew is written to believers, actually young believers. And his intent is to disciple them. And so Matthew is a great place for us. We're going to look at some passages, and we're not going to have time, not even close, uh, to go some places. We'll do that later. Because I am just, 
I'm convinced that we don't have a clue a lot of the time or we become so dull of what a disciple looks like. Now, in Matthew 4, Jesus has already gotten some of his disciples. And uh, let's go to verse 23, Matthew 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom or the good news of God's kingdom, his rule and reign. And healing, everybody say all. All kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. And those who were demon possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. I want you to get a picture of this, guys, because I he's got his 12 disciples. Can you imagine? I mean, we get wild. We get excited about the supernatural, right? We do. I mean, it, it's I'm one of those. And can you imagine being one of the 12 and, and everybody's, every disease is getting healed. I mean, every disease. Every demon's going flying. And you're rubbing elbows with Jesus. You're the catcher, you know. You, you are right there with them. And you get really jazzed about it. You get really excited about the supernatural power of God. But I want you to go to the next chapter. Matthew 5. It says, In seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and then he opened his mouth and he taught them. Now, I, I like the message Bible in this. The message reads like this. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him the committed climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. Now, Jesus has just done incredible stuff. More than any, you know, we, we've all been to our conferences. We've all seen some miracles. But I tell you what, I don't think anything we've ever seen, all of them put together, would come close to all the miracles that just happened. And see, Jesus, his focus is not on healing. His focus is not on the supernatural. His whole focus, if you really read the Gospels right, is he's picking out 12 guys and he's going to pour his life into 12 men. Not, now, he went about, you know, when, when he saw Satan harassing the demons, because he was, his heart was in another kingdom. He was from another kingdom. He wouldn't put up with this one. It just ticked him off, you know. And so he's going to command those things to go. But I want us to get a glimpse because some of us are so preoccupied with seeing the miraculous that we've lost sight of what Jesus has called us to do. And that is to make disciples. At the end of this book, in Matthew 28, you can see where, where Matthew understands, you know, his focus is these new Christians because he says, "What this is what you know, we're called to do. Go and make disciples of all nations. Amen? Now, you say you're a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And so how many disciples are you discipling right now? What are you chasing? What are you going after? Now, we all have different callings and ministries and all that kind of stuff. I understand that. And some of us say we're disciples. We say he is our Lord, <laughs> right? He's our master. He's the head one of our, of our lives. And yet, we don't have time to spend with him. And if he says something in his word to do and we don't want to do it, we say he's okay with that. And see, we've been, we've, we've bought a lie. 
in, the, in this passage, and we call them the Beatitudes, he talks to them not about the supernatural in the sense that what we think of, though it really is. He talks about heart things. Because the heart things will determine where you go and what you do. If your heart, we were reading a, a psalm last week in my texting group, and it says your heart has, has went away or, or been pulled aside to other things. What you're thinking about, your heart follows. And you begin to speak what's in your heart. And what you speak, you begin to do. And it becomes a lifestyle. Jesus understands his disciples, even though they've been brought up in church, good fishermen, tax collector, you know, all those things. He, he knows that they think like the world thinks. Oh, they're Jews, I understand that, and they have a better perspective than most. But he understands that he is going to have to work at changing the way they see things. The Bible, the New Testament, is full of changing the way we think. Because the way the kingdom works is not the way the world works. He says here, help us, Jesus. <laughs> I always have compassion when, when Richard does this. Oh, my God. <laughs> And if my wife leaves before I'm done, it's not because she's ticked. Uh, she's got a commitment. Blessed are the poor, blessed to be envied, honored by God, lifted up by God, are those who are poor in spirit. Not who, bless God, did you see what I did? <laughs> Led five people to the Lord this week, bless God. <laughs> what have you been doing? <laughs> Raise one from the dead? I mean, you know, have you heard that stuff? I've been around that stuff, and it gags me anymore. Mike Bickle said something that's really interesting, and I'm, I'm getting old, so. He said, you know, when I first got saved, I really didn't want to read the Bible much, didn't want to pray much, but I love going to meetings. <laughs> but the older I get, the less I want to go to meetings. And I want to be with the Lord, and I want to get in His Word. These, these guys here, I'm sorry, they're just so much. These guys here are going to hear the Word of God from the Word of God. That's where they start, and then the Holy Spirit later on is going to take that and, and take it on. We start with the written Word of God. God has an expectation that we're there then we take that and we apply it, and he does just crazy stuff. So he's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, blessed are the guy who is dependent on the Lord and doesn't think he is some kind of somebody special. I mean, we are in the sense that God loves us, but it's not arrogance. Hello? Blessed are those who mourn. What? When you cry, now different commentaries think look at it different ways. One is, blessed are you when, you when you weep over your own sin. When you say, God, I'm just so, there's a blessing that comes. Or those who cry out in tears for somebody who's lost. There's a blessing. Because as I cry out, I hand it over and there's a release. Amen? It says, blessed are those for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek are the humble. They're not trying to get their way. They're not demanding. They're not pushy. <laughs> this is great preaching. This is this Matthew 5 through about 8 is basically Christianity 101, and we never read it. We pick out that when he healed, 
He healed every disease. He cast this, that. That's what we pick out. But I'm telling you, there has to come a change in the way we think. Now, I'm going to. Well, let's, let's finish it up here, this part. Blessed are the. Oh, come back here, Jesus. <laughs> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What are you hungering and thirst for? A bigger car? Better job? Get your bills paid? What do you mean, hunger and thirst? What are you preoccupied with? What's your head on all the time? Now, we all have right things that we want, but this is what he's saying. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, they want to know what's God's ways and what he wants to do. How does he do it? How does he look at this? Amen? For they shall be filled. Everybody say filled. I mean, there's a lot of people looking for filling <laughs> and feeling. And he says, blessed are the merciful. Sometimes we're some of the most unmerciful people. We're too busy. We want to hold on to what's ours. We're afraid somebody's going to take what we have. We keep score. We keep track of what our husband or our wife said or somebody at the church. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy from heaven. Can I just, you know, when I don't give mercy, I've judged you. And I've put myself back under that law that says this is right. This is wrong. You don't deserve it. I do. And we all, well, I better not say all. Richard and Greg and Don are holy people, so they probably don't do this kind of stuff. But <laughs> I'm getting a witness. Oh, it's wonderful. But see, when I'm not, when I don't show you mercy, mercy means I, I, bless you when you don't deserve it. I do good to you when you don't deserve it. When you're a butt, when you're a jerk, I still am nice to you. Hello? It doesn't mean I give in to every all your whims. It doesn't mean I don't hold you accountable, especially if you're a believer. Paul said there's a whole set of rules for those who are lost. They're a different set than the ones who are saved and they ought to know. But see, when I don't do that, it's because, you know, I, I, I become selfish and, and I put myself and I open my ears and my head up to all, all this law, all this condemnation that the enemy screams in my ear and said, you didn't do this right, you didn't do this. You know, you always do that. You always screw up. You're always. You get what I'm saying? So are you a disciple? <laughs> and there's this one. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I love the message on this one, too. It says... You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. Okay. Donna spoke last week about love. Did a great, great job on that. And... And the next sesh, section in this talks a lot about how we do life. Not, it's not an optional. It's not if I feel like it. God said this is the way you do it. If you want blessing, if you want to be blessed, 
But more than that, because, see, we, we've, painted, we've painted this Christian world that I just do things so I get good things back. Not I do good things because Jesus deserves it. And we become self-centered charismatics. God does want to bless us, but if that's the only reason we're doing it, that ain't God. He goes into this dialogue about how we treat our enemies, our employers, <laughs> our whatever. And he says we treat them nice when they don't treat us. He says we pray for them. He says we bless them. We do good even when they're using us. Isn't that what the word, that's what he said. I'm, read it, read it. So what does that look like? It looks like suffering. I suffer when I don't get to do what I want to do for the benefit of somebody else. And that's called love. Now here's the kicker, because we've gotten so deceived, suffering brings joy. Jesus said for the, he, he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Paul talks about suffering these things for the joy. See, it's, when it's all about me, I'm never going to be happy. When I'm not willing, a disciple lays his life down, guys. And, and we, we get unhappy, we get frustrated, and we, we put so much on what we want and we're really not asking the question, what does he want? Amen? And the, and the deal is, the way God thinks, we need to learn to think that way. And part of that, part of that is how does God think about, what does he think about you? Because in the midst of all of that stuff, a, a, a lot of the reasons that we do stupid things and say stupid things is because we have this picture that God really doesn't, well, he, he loves us because he has to, but he has to put up with our crap. And he's kind of tired of it. And I, there may be some truth in that. <laughs> but he doesn't stop loving. And the way he looks at you is not usually the way we look at ourselves. And one of the things about taking the Bible and looking at it is we get a more accurate picture of what God thinks and how he sees us. Now, I've got two object lessons. I better get them. And we're, we got to get out of here. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody, this is a quiz. Cindy and Mike are gone. We have a farmer back there. Does anybody know? Can you even see what that is? It's a seed. Does anybody know what kind of seed? <laughs> a bean. Now, this is a green bean seed. Lon and Jody are intimately in, you know, they know, they love green beans. Now, if I told you that's a green bean, you'd say, I, you can't pull one over on me. I've seen green beans. That's no green bean seed, right? Right? When you got saved, that, that nature of the Lord came inside you, and you became a new person. It, it came in a seed form, right? But it doesn't look like it. And God says, you're this or that. I have this or that for you. But all we can look at is the seed, that little Mickey Mouse person that we are. <laughs> you know, what's God? And yet, and yet that one seed... can fill up more than just a couple cans of green beans, that one plant. God's intent, as he put his spirit inside you, is to not only have a relationship with you, but it's for you to bear fruit. And you say, well, I don't, I don't look at my, you know, I've, I've got this, I've got that. But he said that everybody in this room is called to make a disciple disciples some of us that is our children i agree with that but that's not the end and sometimes we go looking for people maybe to 
to uh, pray for or whatever. But oftentimes we go and pray for somebody, but we have no, no thinking or intent about discipling or maybe leading that person to the Lord and to see their life change. See, it's a lot easier just to pray for you and maybe even see your, your, your leg grow out or your eye get healed and then walk away. It's a whole other thing to say, you know, lead you to Jesus and say, I'll be there for you and I'll walk it out with you. You know what? Jesus, it took him. You think Jesus was good at this stuff? It took him three years to get 12 guys ready. Well, one didn't even get ready. He missed it. See, we have this mindset about, you know, this big thing or that thing. Jesus has called everybody in this room to make disciples. If you are one. And he's called everybody in this room. You know how you get from this or from my little seed to this? What has to happen for this seed to produce these things? Well, before you water it, what do you got to do? So you, you bury the thing. Jesus said, you know, you want to be my disciple? I mean, do you really want to be my disciple? You have to die to you today. And you have to die to you tomorrow. If you want to experience joy, if you want to experience your destiny, guess what? you got to die. If you want to produce fruit, you got to die. Giving up what you want for somebody else to make it better for them, to let them encounter the Lord. We have so many pursuits and things we want to see, but my question is, do you want to see fruit? Do you want to see people come to know Jesus? Is that the... Is that priority in your thinking or is that just kind of something over here on the side that you know if I can work it out but what's really important is I achieve this thing or I have this thing am I making sense am I being too plain and I'm not beating anybody I just the world that we live in is pressed in so much and we have it affect us so much that we don't even realize how much we look and act like the world. Jesus said, you know what? When the salt has lost its savor, its saltiness, that salt, they, they, they would take fish and they would put it in the salt and it would pull out the, the moisture and they kept using it over and over. But when they stopped using it, it was when you couldn't tell any difference between the taste of the fish and the taste of the salt, then they'd throw it out on the ground and use it like for road matter. And, and a lot of it is we think wrong thoughts. We think. Anybody know what this is? <laughs> it was created by Satan. <laughs> <laughs> I think golf probably was. I, I think it was probably designed in the pit. But anyway, I can get more frustrated with a golf club than just about anything. But anyway, can you all see? How many of you ever played golf or putt-putt? <laughs> now, there is, a, there is a purpose for this ball. It's to go into a hole several hundred yards down that way. That's its destiny. Amen? Now, the way it gets there is by this club hitting it. Now, there's a, there, there is a key. I hate Dick's not here. He's the golfer guy. Let's see who I can hit out there. That, this isn't a golf ball. It's a, it's a ping pong ball. But the, the thing with this, if, if that ball is going to reach its destiny, it's going to get there faster and for certain if I do this one main thing. If I keep my eye on the ball, if I look up, I'll miss it completely. Or instead of instead of me, what is this? Seven, so maybe 130, 140 yards. Instead of go 140 yards, it might scoot and go about to where Shirley is. I have to keep my eye on it. 
or it's not going to get to where I need where it needs to go. I have to keep my eye on the Lord. Or I'll never reach it. If I let this person, or that person distract me, if my mind gets thinking about other things, I have to just. I have to purpose to keep my eye on it. If I don't, what's going to happen is I'm going to go a little bit here, you know, then I'll, and you know, it, it should take maybe, if it's par three, three, three uh, hits, it may take me 25. Because <laughs> I'll go here, and that's what a lot of us do. We get distracted. We, we, we miss it. Instead of us going where we need to go, we get preoccupied with this little thing over here and say, Lord, forgive me, and we get back, and, we, and, and then, whoa, you know, what about that? I forgot, hey, I get concerned about what my sister's thinking or, or I compare myself to somebody else. Or, Amen? I have to keep my eye on him. We were called to be followers of Jesus. We're called to be disciples. That's what we signed up for, guys. Now, if... If that's gotten translated into, I got signed up so I'd have a better life, and that's all it is, we've missed it. Because we have churches that people come in, and they're like, what can you do for me? Rather than people that come in and say, what can I do for you, Lord? And that that comes out to what can I do for others. A lot of this, Matthew 5 through 8, if you haven't read it for a while, I really encourage you to do that is about what I do for others. Jesus said a little bit toward the end of that. He said, you know what? Why do you guys call me master or Lord? Let me ask you a question. Is he Lord of your life? Be careful how you answer that. Well, maybe at 6 o'clock this morning he was, but right now he may not be. You know what I'm saying? Lord means my life centers around what he wants. My decisions that I make, how I treat people, how I do my business, what I say keeps him in mind and what he wants. Right? Right? And he said, why do you guys call me Lord when you don't do what I say? I don't get it. That's what he says. I don't get it. You guys call me Lord, and you don't do what I say. What the flip? (laughs) You know? And so what does he say? He said, you know what you're going to be like if you call me Lord and you aren't obedient? Stuff's going to happen. Stuff's going to hit the fan. Guess what? You're going to get demolished in the midst of it. Because your life is not really on me. It's on everything else. How you feel, what somebody said, what I want, what I want for my kids, and all those other. It's all consumed with all of that. But he said, if you're obedient, if you do what I say, you're, you're like a house that's on rock. And it doesn't matter what comes. Amen. And in the, the words of one wise man named Richard, and that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> I, the Lord, as I was searching him, you can come up, Kurt, if you want is we, we've, we've lost what it means to be a disciple and to make disciples. We're not intentional about it. We don't really think. Our idea of making disciples is bring them to church and, and, and we'll have a class and we'll get them straightened out. Discipleship is more about information. It's about living it out before them and asking questions and being for them and sometimes getting in their face a little bit and Richard and I were having this one of those talks, and I tell you, I 
God's called us to make disciples and be his. Jesus wasn't warm and fuzzy with them. He didn't say, oh, you're having a bad day. It's going to be okay. Let me help you. He said, hey, get over yourself and follow me. I mean, that's kind of the way he said it. Well, hey, I got to go to Good Wines. I got, I got my, my, my family. They died, and we got a funeral to take care of. And he said, let the dead bury their dead. You going to come with me or not? Or what are people going to think about me? What are they going to say? What's this going to cost me? I mean, that, that's... And, I, and I'm preaching this stuff, guys, and I'm not there. I'm, but I'm, I'm, I have a holy frustration inside me. And what's really strange, I'm, Richard and I met with some pastors Friday, and I've talked to some others. And I talk, I've talked to some of you guys, and there's this holy frustration that we know where we're at is not the way it's supposed to be. And, and we know there's more, but it's really not so much more of God as much as it he needs more of us. And, and I, it reminds me of a time back several years ago, right before Toronto and, and Pensacola, there was this holy frustration with where we were at. Because we've gotten satisfied in a bad way. We become passionless because we don't want to stick out or be weird. So I just I just want you to ask your ask the Lord this week. Where are you? What's he calling you to? How much time are you spending asking him? It's not like it's super hard cuz he's just said, "Ask and I'll sh- I'll reveal it." Is there something that you, of the Lord you, you want to know him? He said, seek, and you're going to find it. But it requires you to do that. Knock. Persistence. Would you stand on your feet? I'm sorry, this is late. But in my defense, I started. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Would you grab the hand of the person next to you? Because what I'm, what, what what we're sharing is not just something that you're going to make a decision today. You could, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, He's worth giving your life away to. He'll make it. He'll make it better than you ever could. And if you said yes to Him, but you're not following Him, you need to do something, guy. You can't keep you can't keep sinning and saying it's okay. And thinking God to just turn his eye on it because it will eat your lunch. I'm not saying he won't forgive you. That's not the issue. You, you said, I will obey you. I will, you will be my Lord. Then let's be people of our word and do it. So, Father, we thank you today that you love us. As unlovely as we are, and especially the way we used to be, you loved us. Lord, you look at us as sons and daughters. You look at us as grown up, producing fruit and being like Jesus. And Lord, we look at ourselves today, and we, we sometimes, Lord, we feel like we're so far from that. But Lord, we're asking you, that as we read your word to make it come alive and let us see things accurately the way you do. Let us step into who we we really are. Lord, let the reality that Jesus paid the price to deliver us, to save us from our sins, that we don't have to continue sinning that thing over and over. You called us to be free, and you paid the price for it. Lord, I pray that this week, you would just, Lord, just speak to our hearts. Lord, remind us that, that there's somebody out there, maybe one person, maybe two, maybe it's a neighbor that we just need to get to know to, to meet a need in their life to reveal Jesus to. 
but Lord, you called us to make disciples. So Lord, help us. Open up our eyes. Let us see the harvest. Let us see the ones that you have for us. And Lord, let us be willing to die to, die to us, to help them, to love them. We just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I, I do encourage you, if the Lord's speaking to you about something, that conviction, don't, don't just put that aside. That's the Holy Spirit speaking, and He wants to do something with that. And I tell you, one of the most powerful things you can do is go to somebody and say, this is where I'm at, this is what I'm wrestling with, and just let them pray for you. Amen. Let's go outside and get hot. Amen. <laughs> Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. After victory won, 